Anyway, Roger, um, thanks very much for joining me at my Newman Arms um, hub. Uh, how did you first get involved with Gary? Because you were, were you, were you with the Radio Stars at that point? Yeah, uh, we went through a bit of a name transition. We were a band in Melbourne. I might just shut that door. Sorry, Stephen, one sec. I've got a couple of collie dogs that are just about to be fed. <laughs> and so I know, I know what, what's going to happen. There, now, or we'll probably get us some scratching at the door. <laughs> um, yeah, well, it was, uh, let's see, going back 1980, we uh, were in a band in Melbourne and we had a hit and um, a local hit. And then we got the support for Gary, who was bringing his uh, concert to town. And um, we were pretty naive, you know, we'd never even been on a concert stage before we were a pub band. And all of a sudden we had this hit single and we were doing the support for Gary Newman. So it was a big deal, if you could, of course. And um, uh, we did a place down in uh, Melbourne. We did all the East Board dates, Melbourne, Sydney, uh, Brisbane. And um, we had, of course, he had his big set up with the two light towers and everything. And we had this little postage stamp of space in front of his, um, yeah, his set. And so we had literally about, you know, six meters wide and about two meters deep to play in. And um, so we got the support to that. And then um, I used to actually come out with a, um, I had a, a, an ARP synthesizer. That was my pride and joy. That was about all you could afford down in, um, in, in Australia in those days. The equipment was so expensive. But it was yeah, good. It was, pardon? It was a good synthesizer. It was a great synthesizer. And uh, a lot of other guys had Rollins or Korgs in Australia. That's pretty much all you could, um, you could get down here. And the American stuff was really expensive. But I managed to uh, save up, get a job. And I left school so I could get a job to pay for a synthesizer. <laughs> That's exactly what I did. And then I ran away to join the circus and um, fortunately it kind of worked out. But uh, so we used to start the show with um, just me walking out in the dark and starting this low drone and going into this um, synthesizer sort of overture thing, uh, which is quite funny. But I remember the sound when I walked on stage for the first time and it was just this massive sound. It was just me on stage doing it and the spotlight. It was, I'd never, I still remember what it was like and um, the sensation. And so I looked across to the side and I could see Gary in the wings. I'd not met him before. And so I'm thinking, holy shit, I've got, you know, um, I've got a big audience out here and now I've got this guy on the right of me. <laughs> and so I came off stage and um, he'd gone. And so we did our spot and then they did the show, which was just spectacular, of course, mm. uh, at Telecom uh, Tour. And um, then he used to come out each night and watch me do my thing. And then he started chatting to me. And so we, we sort of, um, you know, we chat occasionally. But I, was, I had more conversations with the other guys in the band, with um, Dennis and Chris and Russell and... Paul and said, um, and they're really good guys. I, I remember actually they just come back from Japan, and I'm not sure if they'd already done America, or yeah. Um, yeah. they had, had they? Yeah. Okay, so we're we're the arse end of the tour. You were, <laughs> but um, yeah, they were all walking around with these tiny little headphones on, and um, then I think it was Chris who said to me oh, you've got to have a listen to this. We went up to their hotel room and um, I think it was, it was either Chris or Russell and um, they put these headphones on me and I'm listening. I'm thinking, that is amazing. What is that? And they said, it's this new thing from Japan. 
It's called a Sony Walkman. <laughs> it was like, <laughs> but it did yeah. in those days. There was nothing like it. And all the guys in the band had one, yeah. every one of them. They're all walking around with these, these really hyped top end um, little cassette players. <laughs> but it was groundbreaking. And um, so I thought, wow, these guys are so high tech. <laughs> and um and they were for those days you know they were indeed. and so um yeah so yeah so we um we ended up doing that tour and th at the end of it uh gary and james the singer got along quite well and so i think it was a few weeks later um we got a call from gary's management saying um do you want me to produce an album for you? You guys come over here and um, we, um, and I'll, I'll produce it and you record at uh, Rock City. And so we said, yeah, right. So it was just James and I went over and the idea was we would just do the record and the other guys would follow on and would do this um, support tour for Gary's UK um, okay. tour. And so, you know, of course, that was just like a dream come true for us, uh, for the little, you know, uh, country cousins down in Melbourne, all of a sudden to be doing a UK tour of support. And um, so we went over there and uh, James and I, actually, James and I were living in a caravan at the back of his property. Well, Gary was still living with his mum and dad. Right. right? you got this rock star who's sort of been selling records all around the world and here he is living at home with mum and dad <laughs> and uh so we're james and i are in the caravan and then each morning would uh gary would take us or his dad would take us off to the studio and uh i think it was nick smith engineering um and so pretty much within about three weeks we kind of realized that everything was starting to sound a bit like gary mm. and so it created a bit of a, a problem for us because um even though james was the the main songwriter um in the band we we're in but um it just created a bit of a problem because our identity was being um eroded and so it was a really delicate subject and it's really difficult to say well it's not really working out because we're starting to sound like you mm. and there's already one of you and where did we go so i was quite prepared to see it through but james decided we had to pull the plug mm. the problem was at that stage um Gary asked me if I would also play in his band. Yeah. So the idea was we would um, play the support in our band. Then I would walk backstage, walk around into one of the yeah. lighting towers and, and do the gig. So I was, um, we were recording at Nomus, we were rehearsing at Nomus and we'd start at nine in the morning. And with gary's band and then we'd finish up at about six or seven mm. and then my band would come in and would go through till midnight and that went on for three weeks i was totally knackered before the uh the tour had even started you know? didn't but, james say in his book that um on on the album he was doing with gary or what you were then talking about that gary actually wanted him to sound more like him which I think we've just more or less said. Yeah. Yeah. I, th I think everything Gary does sounds like Gary. Yeah. Even, even today, even today with all the technology and all the sounds and different musicians. Um, I think his sound has evolved a little, but at the heart of it is still the thing that he started with. Yeah. And um, it, it was heavy in the drones and heavy in that kind of thumb. Um, are you there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. Sorry, it just, um, yeah, it just kind of, it just kind of went weird. 
Oh, well, okay. you're back. there's only seven thousand miles between us, so. Yeah, that's right. It's not like you're on Mars. <laughs> Might as well be. Um, yes. Yeah. yeah, so um, it kind of, um, yeah, it, it presented a bit of a problem for me because James wanted to then <clears throat> kill the album. And this is, of course, way before I assassin. Mm. Uh, because that was, there were two parts to my association with Gary. This was the first one when I went over there. And so the other guys actually pulled up in. Um, well, the, the guys in the band had come over, of course, because we were rehearsing both bands at the time. And then um, they decided to go back home. But I said, I can't, I've made a commitment. Mm. And um, I, I have to follow it through. I really want to follow it through, you know. Yeah, yeah. Because um, um, I think I was replacing Dennis at that stage, Dennis Haynes. You were, yeah. And, uh, right. And um, and he, of course, replaced Billy Curry, who had um, left, I think, just before the Australian tour. No. And Billy Curry was a bit of a hero of mine. I was I was looking forward to meeting him. Yeah. Um, but, um, uh, yeah, that, obviously, I then stepped into Dennis's shoes. And that was, um, that was quite something. Um, it was always my dream as a kid at school to be my exercise books instead of filled with um, algebra problems and uh, you know maths and science and history. They were filled with keyboard rigs. That was how I spent my time at school. You know, I'd be drawing. Oh, here's me with my uh, big modular synthesizer, and here's me with my big. ARP 2600 and you know so to be actually on stage <coughs> pardon me <coughs> to be on stage in these booths they were just filled with gear mm. they were filled with the gear that until that point there are probably only a couple of musicians in the world who had those big yeah. rigs like Rick Wakeman and Keith Edison and guys like that and so when you're growing up as a 16 year old kid that's what you want but you can never afford it especially here in australia and um so the um i walk into this tower and there's two poly moogs and um a mini moog over here and an arp odyssey there on a profit five and um in in the rehearsal room um, Gary had a, a sync. I, I walked over and I said, that's a synclavia. He said, yeah. And he, I said, is anyone playing it? And he said, no, no one really wants to. If you like, you can take it home and have a fiddle with it. <laughs> and this is something that's like worth, you know, it's in those days, it was kind of like the deposit on a house. Yeah. yeah. And here yeah. I was sitting idle. He said, yeah, I just couldn't make it sort of fit in with anything. And I don't know how it works. So it's just sitting there and um i don't know it's what fifty thousand pounds or something at the time thirty thousand i forget exactly but it was enormous uh, i didn't take it home because our place um was probably not the place where you'd want to keep something like that the the apartment i was living in at the time um well actually no that was after we we're living in a hotel at the in paddington at the hotel carlisle all of us crammed into the, all the band members crammed into this one room and um we lived like that for about three months then the band went home i went on tour so um yeah and then we just started um touring up and down britain i think we did about eight dates or something i can't quite remember I think it was more it's a while back now i think it was more but how did you come out with uh, was it um Every day I die solo at the end, or the instrumental part. I um, just Gary just asked me to fiddle on and the, uh, and I think it was on the Odyssey. Mm. I think because it was the most familiar keyboard to me. Um, it was just a, it was just a noodle, really. Mm. Um, it's like when he asked me. On the live album, I did the the Down in the Park intro. Yeah. Um, 
and he asked me to do the piano intro. Um, and that was just a, a noodle. Mm. And eventually after you do it so many times, it just became a thing. Yeah. And, um, but then there was the, the time at Hammersmith Odeon where um, uh, I'm standing on Hammersmith Odeon thinking, I used to dream about this place when I was a kid. And so it was pretty amazing to be there. And then, of course, the spotlight's on. I'm doing the intro to Down in the Park. And I'm really in the moment. And then I look up and I'm in the, the booth with my 13 keyboards and the spotlight's burning my scalp from about six inches above my head. And half the time, you know, in those things, you had to play like that. Yeah. yeah. Because the heat was so intense, it would actually burn your scalp. Mm. but anyway i'm doing the intro to down in the park and I'm, it's being filmed it's being um recorded for a live album and it's my moment and i look up and there's gary looking in my you know the, the pillbox window and uh he's going and i'm looking at him saying what he said cut it cut it and so i to stop playing. He walked to the center of the stage and the spotlight came on him. Yeah. He said, sorry, our keyboard player got a bit carried away. That's not the next song. <laughs> I'd, I'd skipped the song. And of course, in those days, everything had to be exactly the next song because it was all synced to the live show. And <laughs> the, the, um, the guy in the front of house had his everything set up sequentially. And so, yeah, he embarrassed me in front of the hole. Um, he asked me to take a bow, I think, or something. I can't remember. But, uh, yeah, that was my big moment at Hammersmith Odeon. You know, to, I, was the, uh, I was humiliated in front of 2,500 people. <laughs> <laughs> well, they cut that out of the video anyway. So, <laughs> yeah, it's a good thing. Yeah. But then you, you worked on the dance album as well, didn't you? Or you played? Um, um, did I? Yeah, yeah. Mick Khan's on it. And, um, well, your predators on it. So, <laughs> okay, okay. I, 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 I can't remember to be honest. Okay. Well, well, In fact, it's it's yeah. I I remember. I don't even remember in great detail um the i assassin sessions mm. i remember bits and pieces but um i remember more about what we got up to on tour <laughs> so um then you went on the assassin tour which was with a completely different yeah. band wasn't it yeah yeah that was with pino pino paladino because we recorded the i assassin album and well, I'd actually, um, do you want me to um, tell the story about the second, how I got to meet with Gary the second time? Yeah, sure. Because I actually went back to Australia after the UK tour. Yeah. And so uh, three months after we're back here, the band split up. <laughs> <laughs> so I could have stayed, I could have stayed in Britain. I could have you know, stayed with the band. And there would have been fun, and but everything sort of went belly up back here. So um, James ended up saying, "I've had it with Australia because the record company wouldn't let us release um, the stuff we wanted to do." Because after being in um, the UK for several months, the band had taken on all these different influences, mm. and. Um, we sounded quite different to the band that left Australia. We'd matured quite a lot because in those days, it was really difficult to um, get influences from the UK and abroad because you didn't have access to, to in order to get enemy or sound on or um, sound on sound or any of the British uh, publications, um, you had to wait three months. Mm. you know before something would turn up and you'd get very little news back here of um of um 
trends and things. You, you, we're always after the after the curve in Australia. So living there and experiencing all this stuff was quite mind blowing, and quite a development mm. stage for me as well, just in my personal attitude and the way that I approach uh, music. So anyway, James decided to uh, move back to the UK. A few months later, he was urging me to do it. And I said, no, I'll just see what I can get going here. Then I decided to follow him. So I ended up sitting, I was in um, living in Ealing Common for about six months. And James had decided to leave and go back to Australia and I just sort of left me sitting there by myself. And um, oh, I was rooming with um, the drummer from the band who had come over. And um, I was washing dishes at Jaguar. Really? In I think, White City. Yeah, that was the only job I could get. Right. And so, yeah, that was pretty tough. <laughs> and then. I picked up the paper one Sunday morning and there was this thing on the front page, Gary Newman crash lands at Dover. Mm. And so then I was reading the story thinking, bloody hell, that's kind of interesting. So I still had his mum and dad's home number from when we stayed there last time. So I gave them a call and I just said, um, uh, I just wanted to, um, you know, so I just read about Gary in the paper. I hope he's okay. Um, 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 and they said, oh, hello. Yes, I haven't seen you for a, a year or so. Um, well, he's right here. Do you want to talk to him? So I said, yeah, sure. Put him on. So he said, hello, how are you doing? I said, good. He said, where are you? I said, back in London. He said, okay. Um, he said, I said, are you all right? And he said, oh, yeah, it was just a, you know, just ran out of petrol and, you know, just landed when we got, when we found some land. And he said, um, what you doing? And I said, Ah, uh, not too much. And he said, "Want to join my band?" And I said, "Ah, uh, okay. <laughs> okay, all right." Well, he said, "I'll come around tomorrow and pick you up, and I'll take you out to um, uh, to the studio." And so I went from washing dishes at Jaguar to him picking me up from our house, which was soon to be condemned, um, literally, um, in his Ferrari. It was just really weird, you know, yeah, yeah. and we got along really well. Um, Gary and I got along really well. He took me out to his, by that stage, he wasn't living with his mum and dad. He was living in this mansion mm. um, in, um, I've forgotten the name of the area now, suburb, so out well. near, <laughs> yeah, Blackbush Airport, where it used to fly. Yeah. And so from there, and so I stayed with him while we were recording our assassin. He had no furniture in his house. No. Barely a stick. Yeah, it was just, um, it was, I remember he had this shag pile carpet. It was so weird. It was everywhere and it went halfway up the walls. <laughs> and I thought, it looks like a big, you know, you could film a really good porno in a place like that. <laughs> but there was, there was nothing in there except for, you know, a few bits and pieces in this massive great house. And out the front, I remember we drove up in the Ferrari and this, he got this Corvette in parked out the front in this U-shaped driveway. Mm. And I said, you've got a Corvette as well. Mm. He said, yeah, don't drive it. It's got something wrong with the, the axle. I think he said it was a gift from Beggar's Banquet. I remember. Oh, I know. I know. Yeah. So I'm looking at this, thinking, bloody hell, <laughs> this is quite different to where, what I was, um, what to what I'm doing at the moment, washing dishes at, uh, for Jaguar, <laughs> yeah. living in a house soon to be condemned. And um, so yeah, and so straight away, we just started recording. I think, I think they had already started recording some stuff because Mick Khan had already played some tracks. Mm. I think that's right. And then um, Pino came in a bit later and then Chris turned up. And so I think we did um, a week or two just on the Lindrum. Mm. 
and then Chris, um, I remember his last name. Chris Payne. He went on to. No, um, oh. the drama. Oh, Chris Slade. Um, Chris Slade. Chris yeah. Slade. Yeah. Yeah. So we had the Welsh rhythm section uh, with Pino and Chris. Yeah. And I remember Chris turned up with these really weird fiberglass drums that were like shells that sort of scooped out mm. like tubes. Yeah. And they looked, they looked fantastic. I don't think they sounded very good, but they, um, but Chris just used to slam the crap out of those things. Mm. And um, he was a good drummer, no doubt. And Pino, of course, you know, needs no, needs no praise. He's just something else completely. Indeed. Um, yeah, and he really um, gave that album the colour and the, the scope, I think. He, he really turned it into something else. Mm. He turned it into a, a sort of a, a funk version of Tube Way Army. Yeah, it was Something it was kind of weird. Yeah, but it was a great blend, and I guess he kind of picked up from what um, Mick Khan had started. It's that style of fretless playing, mm. but it was it was a fluidity that I thought was wonderful. Uh, one of the things that um, Gary had a very um, strident. Um, sound to his music and I think Pino added something else that just gave it that other um, ability to sort of flow, flow in and out and um, that stopped it being so um, staggered and um, episodic in a sense. Yeah, but that was, um, it, that was amazing. But then you went on the American tour in 82 with that um, Eye Assassin tour. We did. Yeah. And um, I think we rehearsed for about um, three or four weeks in California. Mm. And um, then um, Yeah, that's right. And then we were, we were, we, um, we had a big bus that had been organized and I think a lot of dates got canceled. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. And then, so we ended up getting on a smaller bus, like a, more like a commuter van. And so, um, <laughs> I think we were driving through, I've got an idea it was Colorado and, um, yeah, I think it was all oh, it's Wyoming. It might have been Wyoming. Because I remember looking out the window and going, Buffalo. <laughs> Bison, apparently, but it, to me it was like, wow. You know, it was, and they, it was a it was a bison farm. And um it's like, wow. And then the, the mountains, the snow capped mountains. And I think we were up quite high, so it must have been somewhere around Wyoming. It could have been Colorado. But uh, we were winding up through these long hills and it was in the middle of the night and um, I heard all this commotion and um, then the bus slowed down and then I think it was Gary's father driving mm. and he said, uh, everyone out of the bus, it was on fire. Oh, yes. <laughs> so it, it caught fire and so we're in, literally in the middle of nowhere there were no city lights there was no lights we were in the country in mm. the mountains in freezing cold there was snow on the ground and the damn bus was on fire the engine had caught fire so everyone's piling out and i saw some lights across a field and so i went running off to the lights mm. to call the house to, and i said i'll i'll call for a for a fire engine or someone <laughs> <laughs> rescue SAS you know um, and so I went running I remember running it was the middle I've been in this nice warm cabin and all of a sudden I'm running off to this um, this set of lights across a field in the middle of nowhere and it was going from a warm environment into a cold one it really 
my lungs were just exploding mm. with the temperature difference. And I had, um, I got to this place, it was a bar. It was a bar in the middle of nowhere. Across a field, it was like three o'clock in the morning. Yeah, yeah. And I pile in there. And it's, it's like something from a movie, like an old, you know, um, Western bar with you know, cow heads and horns on the on the walls and timber paneling, everyone drinking their coors and their bud and Jim Beam. Mm. And there's probably about 20 people in there, 3 a.m. And so I walk in and uh, I just said, I was trying to get out the words, the bus is on fire, call the fire brigade. And they were just staring at me like, who is this guy? They mm. couldn't understand the word I was saying, so I couldn't get the words out because it, the cold had taken all my breath. And so eventually I did, and I said, our bus is on fire, it's out there. Mm. And one of them looked out the window and they can see that, yeah, <laughs> something's on fire. So they, um, I went back to the bus and um, by the time I got back there, a fire engine was there and all the stuff had been pulled out, a tow truck arrived, everything got carted off and then we ended up having to get a big tour bus and then the tour could start for real. <laughs> <laughs> so it was a it was a really good lesson in um, don't try and skimp on the travel arrangements <laughs> but how did you find it all gary it, it seemed never to go get going and there was a lot of shows were cancelled weren't there yeah um and i'm not sure exactly why that was because um maybe it was too soon after the last tour i really don't know um so it got downscaled yeah. um we couldn't take the whole production over there um so the lighting towers were um were left off uh everything was scaled back to literally more like a a pub band mm. a big a, a large production pub band and so uh, we still had the same amount of keyboards and everything, but they were just on A frames. Yeah, yeah. And um, he he didn't have his stupid little car, which was great because I hated that thing. And um, the uh, and it always broke down anyway. You yeah. Know? And so um, yeah. um, it was. So we just played on. We I remember we played on a on a. Um, a showboat you know one of those who was it in texas or somewhere like that where they had those old um paddle wheel steamers on the mississippi yes yes and and i remember we were played on one of those and what it was was the whole reason that existed was because it was the only way they could have a casino then if there was a floating on if it was floating on the river mm. You could gamble yeah but if it was docked yeah. it couldn't so um it was just a good excuse to have a casino and then they could you know but it was big enough that they could have a band on a sort of a semi-large concert stage mm. and so um we went on to oh yeah we went on to that and then we started taking off um from the dock shoving off and we'd we'd gone about i don't know half a click or something and then gary said we've got to go back he said i can't go on stage and he, everyone said why and he said um i forgot my hat <laughs> and he just had his hair trunk right yeah. so he had all these plugs in his head so that was the reason for the fedoras on the tour because yeah, yeah. he had to have something to cover his, his his bonnet you know so um so gary's dad had to go up to the captain and say you got to turn around <laughs> he's saying why and we had to turn around this entire floating casino and head back to to the uh dock so that um gary's dad could go get his his hat and um or was it a, I, think I have a, a, another memory though where he actually paid a guy 
he, uh, he said to a guy, um, he had, a, I think, a, a red trucker's cap. And he said, uh, can, I, can I have your hat? And he said, how much? And he ended up paying like a couple of hundred bucks for it or something. I have a, another memory of that too. So I don't know if that was a different time or the same time. You'll have to check on that one. But th both of those two things happened. I know that. But yeah. if you had to sum up your whole um, Newman experience, how would you? Oh, well, it was... Oh, um, it was incredible, really. As I said, it was um, for me in Australia. Where Australia was much further away in those days than it is now, mm. in a sense. Um, it was far more inaccessible to lots of things and to to come from a little band playing in Melbourne to actually play on concert stages with the sort of adulation that he had at the time was quite extraordinary where we'd have um, people roaming the corridors, like hundreds of fans would come to the hotels and the, I've never experienced anything like that. Um, it was a whole other level. It was the dream, you know, um, I, I remember when I went to, when I was staying at Gary's house, we were recording the album, when Freud and I were recording the album he was producing. And he was playing, um, he was playing down in the park on his mum's old broken down, busted up yeah. piano in the lounge room. And um, I thought, wow, that's such a great song. And uh, he said, yeah, this is, I wrote it on here. And he just sort of did it on the piano. It's like, yeah, well, that's why it's such a great song is because it just works on the piano singing. It's a really well constructed song. Yeah, brilliant, brilliant. And uh, yeah, and so that whole experience was, was really um, um, a taste of what it's like in, in the big time, you know. Did you ever hear and, the, uh, him and Gary Dunn, James and Gary Dunn? Um, I, I, I did when we did it, I never listened to it afterward. No, I, um, I, I got a copy off James in about 2005. Um, oh, did you? Yeah. I, I can't see any reason it wasn't released because it's not that bad. I think the problem was at the time, um, I was heavily influenced by um peter gabriel uh, yeah. bowie had released scary monsters uh magazine um were a big influence on me and james had uh, his own influences and what it was was these this was the new direction that after being in london mm. and being in the middle of all this stuff we just found what we were doing with gary to be so completely different to where we felt we were headed and so, and that was the problem. I think the songs were themselves were quite good. Mm. Um, and the production, uh, I remember I would be doing certain things, but Gary would then try and pull the production um, instead of me playing the sounds that I would gravitate to normally. Mm. All of a sudden there'd be a poly moog in there. Mm. And the poly moog with, um, in, with the preset that he used was very much um a signature sound of what gary does yeah yeah and then other things would creep in and so it it was for me it was inescapable that it sounded more like gary than it sounded like us and i think that's a problem for any band indeed um, mm, indeed. especially if you're trying to um you know create your own identity Gary was firmly established at that point. Mm. We were still trying to work our way up the ladder. So it was, it was problematic for us. And, but, um, and moving right forward. Yeah. Where are you today with everything? All good? Yeah, yeah. Um, 
Because you've been doing film stuff and things like that. Yeah. Well, I've primarily, I kind of turned my back on the music industry about 30 years ago, really. Um, mm. When I started moving into film, I stopped playing around with bands in probably 92. And then I always found myself having a more of an affinity with film anyway. I, I always felt I would be better at doing that than I was playing in a band. Because mm. there's something frustrating about playing in a band. Um, there are many things frustrating about playing in a band. Um, a, a lot of it is repetition mm. and doing the same thing over and over again. Um, there's a lot of time you spend on like just waiting around. You're waiting in a hotel room, you're traveling, you get to where you're going, you book into your room, you go to sound check, you hang around until that's ready for you to sound check. Then you go back to the hotel, hotel room, have dinner. Um, then you go to the gig, wait for the gig. It's all about that 90 minutes on stage. Mm. And then the rest of it is just this kind of void of waiting. So it really got to me after a while. I just thought there's, there's more to do. There's more stuff to do. And also I was starting to get frustrated with the, um, with the lack of control and that a lot of the decisions were made by other people. Mm. And I just wanted to take the reins for a start for a, a while. And so when the band I was in at the time with James called models split up, we, um, I just decided to make a good, um, try getting into film. And fortunately that kind of worked out and, um, that was where I was the happiest, I think. Mm is in actually just creating scores and where for, for the, for a large part you're in control and you dictate what you're going to do. And it's not until the producers start to come in and pull the part, which in those days was um, less so than it is now. Right. There seem to be more people uh, picking things apart now that are less experienced. And so, it is a little bit more frustrating now for me than it used to be. Um, but having said that, I swore that I would never set foot on stage again <laughs> until COVID, <laughs> where, everything, where everyone's plans just flew out the window. Indeed. Um, yeah. And so I found I had a couple of series that were ready to go into repetition. They didn't. Mm. everything was shut down mm. and looks like um they're not going forward i i did a show called reckoning that i'm not sure if you've got on youtube over there i uh, sorry netflix um but um it it's like a a murder mystery about a serial killer we have yeah, yeah. you you do okay um well that still hasn't shown in australia for some reason but that was supposed to be um, going for another series where well, that whole thing, I believe, has been canned. So um, everything stopped. Mm. And while things, while we're pretty good with COVID over here at the moment, um, and the film industry and television is, is slowly bouncing back, um, a lot of people have left. A lot of things have shut down. The things that were going have stopped. And the people associated with them now new people have come in and it's kind of like the industry just flipped over to uh, the alternate universe overnight so um it's a bit slow getting back off the ground again and for a variety of reasons new i don't know why but new government regulations have um reduced the um producers offset for film now mm. so yeah, you know, we still haven't recovered economically from this whole thing yet. Uh, they've decided to do this, which is going to take another hit on the film industry. So it ended up, um, are you familiar with uh, the, the band The Church? Steve Kilby, Under the Milky Way tonight? I don't think so, no, I'm not. Okay, okay. 
Well, they've had quite a bit of success in Europe and um, September uh, and America. They've been around for a long time. The lead singer is quite a um, um, a unique character. I call him um, a vagabond poet. Is like a is Steve Kirby. Um, he's quite a um, a really interesting dude. He's a very lateral um, version of um, Bob Dylan in a sense. And so anyway, he was recording up in my neck of the woods, and uh, the drummer who was playing on it called me and said, "You should come down and say hello to Steve because I haven't seen him in decades." And so. Uh, he was about to do a big American tour and then COVID hit. And so uh, it kind of destroyed all of his plans. So he invited me to come down to the studio and play on his album, which I did. And then he was with um, playing with another fellow called Gareth Koch. Now, Gareth is a member of Sapphire, who is a classical guitar band uh, with Slava Gregorian and his brother they're quite popular in europe and they're extremely good classical players in the <coughs> finger picking mm. nylon string tradition you know totally purist and um he was steve was playing with him and so at the end of the session he said look do you want to have a listen to something gareth and i have been working on and they'd already released one album and uh so they played me some stuff and it was quite esoteric and he said they called it ancient music <coughs> so it was music from like a reimagined version of say mesopotamia mm. or um in 2000 bc or um uh the pillars of Aksum, you know in ethiopia um that sort of era and so then Steve would create these little stories of little, little fictitious or sometimes real people in history, and he'd invent little stories about them. They would turn into a lyric idea, which would turn into uh, a musical idea. So it's it's quite it's quite interesting. And I have a a penchant for strange exotic stringed instruments as well as synthesizers and piano. Um, and so I have about, you know, 50 different things ranging from nickel harpers and dulcimers and, um, guitar viols and, um, cello and, um, harpeggies and all these kind of things that I thought, well, this would be a beautiful, a great vehicle mm. to, I said, you need hurdy gurdy on this, you know? And so we ended up writing a double album. Really? And then, yeah, and it, it happened really quickly within, I think it was um, 10 days, we'd had a double album completed, yet to be mixed. And so then, so it's this project has, bec has become Steve Kilby and the Winged Heels. Mm. And so we have a double vinyl album coming out in, uh, a gatefold album coming out in June. Oh, just like the old um, you know prog rock mm -hmm. albums of the of the 70s and so we're putting together some dates on um in june to promote it but we've already be actually been on stage and so i got roped back into playing live <laughs> so we've already done eight nine ten gigs playing live um so here I am back treading the boards again, <laughs> but it's, it's really, it's really quite interesting because, um, I think as you get older, you tend to throw off a lot of those inhibitions you have when you're younger, those sort of expectations. And I think you, uh, you, you don't worry about where you're going because you're already there. Mm. Do you know what I mean? So when I was on stage, I always had trouble looking at the audience because I was so inhibited. Well, now I don't give a stuff, you know, and I'm, I'm just there for the playing and yeah. I'm really enjoying what we're playing because it's so, um, 
I think it's quite unique hmm. because it's a kind hmm. of a folk, uh, uh, semi-folk, semi-electric um, thing, semi-esoteric. It's hard to describe, but I think it's interesting, and it's, there's there's some a lot of energy in parts, and um, it's a little poetic in parts. Um, but yeah, so if I can have that project going, so now that I've initiated that project, if I can have that running alongside other film projects, I would be deliriously happy, you know. Brilliant. Thanks so much, mate. I appreciate that. Right. I'm off to bed. Bye now. <laughs> See you soon, mate. Nope. Yeah, I, yeah. Alrighty. <laughs>